Good luck! Nintendo cancelled Star Fox 2 to shift their attention to the new console, the Nintendo 64. And with that came new possibilities for the series. Miyamoto had visions of Star Fox as a sci-fi epic. The Nintendo 64's improved hardware would allow the creators to use better graphics, voice acting, and a special accessory that would completely immerse the player into the game. To begin, the team decided against making a sequel. They wanted to make the Star Fox they had always intended to, and take advantage of the technology they had with the Nintendo 64. So instead, they made a reboot of the original. The story is essentially the same as the first game, but with a more epic feel. Upon their arrival, Pigma betrayed the team, and James and Pepe were captured by Andros. Pepe barely escaped Venom. As he just heard, one new addition to the game was voice acting. This would give the player more of a connection to the characters and the Star Fox universe. Voice acting was one of the coolest things about Star Fox 64. If you think about it, we never really knew what our favorite Nintendo characters sounded like. Now they were talking to us from the game. Like, if I would accidentally shoot an ally, they would call me out on it. Or if I helped somebody out, they'd say thank you. For the time, it was pretty incredible. Miyamoto wanted a Star Trek slash Star Wars feel to the story and characters. Mitsuhiro Takano, one of the script writers, recalled working with Takaya Imamura on some lines. Imamura wanted a good catchphrase in the game, like how Star Wars had, May the Force Be With You. Takano was playing the game one night and recalled, I kept getting hit and couldn't make any progress. Then, just when I was thinking, alright, I'll give it another shot, that line popped into my head. And that line was... Never give up! Trust your instinct! In fact, the game is filled with memorable lines. Do a barrel roll! You'll never defeat Andros! Hey, Einstein, I'm on your side! The hatches are open! Fire! Fire! Don't let them go! Miyamoto also brought back his love of Thunderbirds. When the characters spoke, they looked like puppets talking. It made the animation work much easier for the developers as well. With the characters and story coming together, the team turned their attention to the gameplay. Would it be an on-rail shooter like the first game, or a more strategic game like Star Fox 2? They ended up combining elements from both, as well as some new additions. The first Star Fox game provided the on-rail shooting, Star Fox team, and the enemy forces of Andross. Star Fox 2 threw in all range mode, the Star Wolf team, and a multiplayer mode. It was like combining two great games into one and giving it a complete overhaul. The game was just about ready to be released, but Nintendo added one more thing that would change not only the game, but the entire video game industry. Enter the Rumble Pack. This thing attached to the back of the 64 controller, and with the help of some batteries, it vibrated the controller based on the action in the game. It came bundled with Star Fox 64 and provided a whole new gameplay experience. This accessory changed the game. After the Rumble Pack, the technology has now become a standard part of most video game controllers. To promote the game, Nintendo also released a VHS tape that showed off all the new features. It stars a Sony and Sega character kidnapping Nintendo employees and forcing them to spill the beans on Star Fox 64. This is incredible! Well, what do you say, guys? You into a little multiplayer action? Let's get ready to rumble. Just like the other promo tapes Nintendo released at the time, it's very corny. Star Fox 64, also known as Lilat Wars in Europe and Australia, was finally released in North America on July 1st, 1997, four years after the original. The game received universal acclaim, and fans showed their support by scooping up 300,000 copies of the game in only five days. Even though Star Fox 64 was a huge success, the franchise went quiet yet again. Fox McCloud was featured as a playable character in Super Smash Bros., but no actual game was set to be released. We wouldn't see another Star Fox game until 2002, and this time around, things would be 
radically different. Back in the mid to late 90s, a British developer known as Rare was putting out big hits for Nintendo, including Donkey Kong Country, Banjo-Kazooie, and GoldenEye 007. Nintendo was heavily invested in Rare, owning a 49% stake in the company. After finishing up Diddy Kong Racing on the Nintendo 64, work began on a game that would push the system to its limit. You see, the Sony PlayStation was putting out some impressive gaming experiences. The CD-based software allowed for heavy use of full motion video and voice acting, something Nintendo's system lacked. Late in the system's life, however, cartridges were being made to accommodate for larger games. The only problem was, these carts were very expensive to make. A blockbuster game would need to be made to take advantage and still have good sales. Rare decided to give it a shot and announced Dinosaur Planet at E3 2000. It was an epic adventure game, similar to The Legend of Zelda. It told the story of Saber and Crystal, siblings, who must rescue their father from Dinosaur Planet while also defeating the evil General Scales. The media was blown away by the first demos. IGN said it was Rare's most ambitious game to date, and that they couldn't help but compare the look of it all to a well-designed in-game cutscene. With the hype building, members of Rare and Nintendo met up at Nintendo headquarters to go over progress of the game. In the meeting room was the mastermind, Shigeru Miyamoto. After looking over footage, Miyamoto couldn't help but notice how similar the character of Saber looked to Fox McCloud. He suggested the game's plot be changed to take place in the Star Fox universe. It was also decided that development should shift to the new Nintendo system coming out, the GameCube. Feelings were a little mixed at Rare. On one hand, you have Shigeru Miyamoto, a legendary game designer, helping you with your game and providing ideas. But on the other hand, all that hard work the past few years has to be tossed aside and Star Fox has to be incorporated into your game. The plot had to be reworked as well. Phil Tossel, one of the lead programmers, recalled the mood. We were slightly disappointed at having to change Dinosaur Planet, as we had all become so attached to it, but we could also see the potential of using the Star Fox license. The name was changed to Star Fox Adventures, and on September 23, 2002, the game was officially released on the GameCube. It was the last time Rare would work on a game with Nintendo. Two days later, Microsoft would officially purchase Rare for $375 million. Star Fox Adventures was received well by critics, but it continues to be a black sheep in the Star Fox franchise. The signature gameplay was gone, and some fans felt a little betrayed by Nintendo. They felt it wasn't a true Star Fox game. GameSpot claimed, those expecting the same sort of frantic shooting action that characterized previous Star Fox games won't find it here. Shigeru Miyamoto was a man who made few mistakes in the video game industry. Most critics agree that changing Dinosaur Planet to Star Fox Adventures was one of them. Rare pays homage to their original Dinosaur Planet game today with this sculpture in the reception area of their headquarters. On the next episode of The Gaming Historian, we wrap up our retrospective on the Star Fox franchise. Oh,